previous three speakers, all experts in AI, work with pretty large computers at universities and institutes. Our final speaker today wants to miniaturize AI to make it as small as possible and, probably more importantly, to use as little energy as possible. Those are some really, really important goals. My friends, please welcome to the stage, Roland Nesselda. This is cool. I'm Roland, founder of Plumerai, a startup in London and Amsterdam. All you hear about today is AI models getting larger and larger, running on chips, consuming more and more. I love AI. I'm really excited about it. But I don't want the future that we're currently ahead of that. AI models are using lots and lots of energy, bringing our planet in danger. Do you remember this slide? I took this photo yesterday during the presentation from Stephen Chu. This graph nicely shows the global electricity consumption of different parts of the economy. The green part, that's data centers. And this forecast predicts that 7.5% of global electricity consumption will be going towards data centers. But this graph, this forecast, is from 2015. And a lot has happened since 2015. If you look at forecasts from today, more recently, you see things like this. Currently, so this is US electricity, Currently, 4% of US electricity is used for data centers. And it's forecasted that in, at the end of this decade, in 2030, it will be 25%. 25% of US electricity will be going to data centers. A quarter of all the electricity. It's scary, right? And I think it's really just the beginning it's going to get so much worse. The easiest way to make your AI model better is to simply make it larger or multiply the AIs and let them all work together as agents. That's why so many companies are focusing on making their models larger and larger so they become better and better, but with that, consuming more and more energy. And as deploying AI models, gets cheaper and cheaper, I'm afraid that these large AI models will be increasingly used for meaningless things. I imagine every person will have an army of lobbyist AIs, fanatically working, calling, writing your local municipal councillor to convince them to pass those rules that are best for you. And then your local municipal councillor will have an army of AIs filtering all that input from those lobbyist AIs, cancelling out each other. With the only result, massive loads of energy being consumed. I'm afraid that the AIs get better and better, the energy use will get completely out of control. The reason why it hasn't happened yet, why energy for AI hasn't already completed their balloons, is because these chips, these specialized chips, there are not a lot of them, and they're very expensive. This will get solved. More manufacturing capacity is being built. The prices will drop. And then the only limiting factor for the rollout of AI will be energy. New power plants, massive power plants, will start to get built, and AI will be ready to eat it all. And AI will be used for good things, for bad things, but either way, it will be consuming lots and lots of energy. So that's the AI that everyone's talking about. 
But there's another AI. One that can do amazing things for us and our planet without consuming wasteful amounts of energy. The solution is to make AI tiny. And I'm talking about really tiny. So tiny that it can run on chips smaller than the point of a pencil. Chips that cost less than one dollar. Chips that can be powered by one of these things for years. Small coin cell batteries. Or even better, by small solar cells. I want to make AI really cheap and really easy to deploy so that we can sprinkle this planet with tiny AIs everywhere to help us and our planet. But making AI tiny is really difficult because, as I just told you, like if you, an easy way to make your models uh, smarter is by making it larger, right? So if I'm making my AI model smaller, it's getting dumber. It's not really true. There are ways so that you can make your AI model smaller without making it dumber, up to a certain degree. But you can make your AI model really small and really smart, but smart in a very narrow sense. So for example, an AI model, and all it does is detect if there's a person in front of the camera and where that person is. And that's what we've been building with the company that I founded, Plumerai. This here, this is a tiny AI model that just detects if there are people and where they are. And the amazing thing is that this AI model is just one megabyte large. And it's really tiny. If you look at GPT-3, GPT-4, there's models that are powering ChatGPT, they're multiple hundreds of thousands times larger. And because we're able to make our AI model so small, we can run it on this tiny chip, we can run it fast on this tiny chip that costs less than one single dollar. Hook it up to a battery and it's used for all kinds of things. Wirelessly connected to your air conditioning unit to detect how many people there are in the room to adjust the flow of air or direct, or direct the vents of the air conditioning units to direct the flow of air towards where the people are sitting. You can save a lot of energy that way. 10% of global electricity usage is going to air conditioning units, and it's growing fast. Or use it to automatically close the shades if there's no one present to, consume more energy, to conserve more energy. Or use it to detect if your elderly parents have fallen and require help. And it's not just for people detection. You can also make tiny models for all kinds of other tasks, like vehicle detection. Connect them to your traffic light systems to detect if a vehicle is approaching to already turn the lights green, or detect if there's an emergency vehicle to give it priority. And you can also use it for other kinds of sensor data. So for example, uh, audio data. You're familiar with, hey Siri, hey Google, that's actually a really tiny AI model running in real time, listening all the time on your smartphone. You can use the same technique um, to create a small model that just detects words like turn on and turn off. And then combine that AI model with another tiny AI model that's running on camera data and detects which angle I'm looking at. And just by combining two, those, those two simple building blocks, you can create these simple but almost magical user experiences. Like when I look at the TV and I say turn on, the TV turns on. But then when I look at the lamp and I say turn on, the lamp turns on. So you can already do some amazing things with these very small models, but I understand it still feels rather limited because they can only do a few things really well. But it's changing. The good news is that these cheap, tiny chips are getting more powerful. The software algorithms are getting more advanced. The training data is getting better. And there is still a lot of headroom. So if you compare it to the brain, human brain consumes about 20 watt. The latest supercomputers that NVIDIA is building are in terms of megawatts. So we're still a factor of 1,000 to a million times off. There's a lot more things we can improve.
So that means that with good hardware and with good software engineering, it's feasible over the next few years to make these tiny battery-powered or solar-powered intelligent sensors um, much more capable. And it's these tiny advanced AIs are on the way. We're creating an amazing future for us and our planet. I want to have tiny machines roaming through, the, through our farms, patiently inspecting each crop, each leaf, giving it just the right amount of water, flagging it if it's ready to be harvested, detecting very early on if there are any diseases or weeds so that you, have to, so that you can reduce the need for pesticides. Or for space, tiny computer vision AI satellites for, for climate monitoring, or small robots that are used for asteroid mining. And those, those are far too far away, so you have a latency issue, so you can't do, rely on remote control. And to get tiny eyes everywhere, so from the tallest treetops in the rainforest, where you need to detect the sound of chainsaws to flag uh, illegal Rainfor rainforest logging, to the corridor of the retirement home to detect an unfortunate fall, you have to make these really easy to deploy. And that means that you can't rely on power cords. In the rainforest, it's kind of obvious you don't have a power outlet, but also in shops, in offices, in homes, you don't want to rely on cables. First of all, because it's ugly, but also because it's really expensive. When I talk with people who want to install intelligent sensors like cameras or other types of sensors in each room in their office, they then learn that it's going to cost them tens of thousands of dollars to just install the cabling. It's typically more expensive. The cabling is typically more expensive than the cameras themselves. So we need to remove those cables and instead power these tiny AI sensors with tiny batteries or even better, small solar cells. And you might think, well, if this tiny AI device has a battery, why would I spend my precious joules, the energy that's inside the battery, on doing AI compute? Why don't I just stream all the data 24-7 to the cloud over 4G or Wi-Fi or satellite link? And then I do the AI computation in the, cl in the cloud, in the data center, because those chips are connected to the mains? Well, turns out that's not correct. It requires more energy to send one image over Wi-Fi to the cloud than process that image locally next to the sensor. So here, see the energy that's required by a cell radio and the energy that's required for the AI compute. And also, the energy, the, the energy requirements are dropping much faster for the AI compute than for the cellular connection. So it gets even more and more important to run your AI models locally on device. And I understand that when I talk about tiny AIs everywhere connected to small cameras, small microphones, it can sound kind of creepy. But by making your AI models really tiny, you're able to remove the creepiness. You can build your intelligent sensor such that no data, so no photos, no video, no sound data, leaves the device. You can air gap it, such that the sensor and AI model is connected with the rest of the system, with the planet, with only one thin wire and that only the output of that AI model can be sent over the wire. Not the video data, not the image data, not the sound data, just the output of that AI model. So that way, you can just photons in, answer out. Sound waves in, answer out. So that's typically really just a binary answer, like, is there a person, yes or no? Based on my microphone and camera data, do I suspect illegal rainforest logging going on? Yes or no? Photons in, answer out. Sound waves in, 
answer out. And as technology gets better and better, the same is becoming possible with language models. Those LLMs like ChatGPT. Today they're hosted in the cloud and they get retrained based on the conversations that you're having with them. But the things you tell your LLM and things that can see in your home, I think those are highly private. I don't want to have that shared with some LLM that's used by, uh, by everyone and let that data being used to retrain it. No, I want to have my own local LLM that's private, that's private and that's secure. And that you have a guarantee that no training data is being shared. And with labels like the one here that states what sensors are there, why are those sensors there, what kind of data is being stored, if you have an air gap sensor or not, if the data is being sent to the cloud or not. These kind of labels, they help consumers to get more insights in how secure or how private their intelligence sensors is, their intelligence sensors are that they are buying. It's like a, like, a, um, uh, like an ingredients list that you have on food items packaging. By relying less on AI in the cloud, we can reduce the risk of a future with creepiness everywhere and instead move towards a future with tiny, thoughtful AIs everywhere. So instead of the enormous AIs that are hiding in data centers, it's the tiny AIs that I'm excited about. Without the needs of thousands of new power plants, without the logistical problems of the ugly power cords, and without, without the creepy privacy problems. And we can get there. We can sprinkle this planet with tiny AIs everywhere to help us and our planet. There's just some more great hardware and software engineering work left to do. Thank you.